It's a mess in this attic. Lot going on, but there ain't no need to panic. Come on up and join. We getting wild, getting manic. Spitting truth for all you fanatics. Uh, every week got something new to say. Ain't no filter. This shit coming straight from the brain. It's coming straight from the brain. Yeah, it's coming straight, coming straight from the brain. What's up, everybody? Today is Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. This is A Talk in the Attic, which means, of course, I'm your host, Kirk Ross, and this is episode 150. 150, people. How's it going out there for you? We're living in strange times, that's for sure. We're almost two years into this pandemic, and even after all this time, the only way to experience any true normalcy is by watching the Detroit Lions lose in a new and inventive way each and every Sunday. We've all seen that wonderful Christopher Nolan movie, Inception, right? If you haven't, then get thee to a VCR at once! Remember how in Inception, each character had a totem? Some relic from real life that they could look at or examine for authenticity, so that way they knew whether they were dreaming or not. Leonardo DiCaprio's totem was that little top that he spun. It would spin indefinitely forever in dreamland. Well, my version of that is the Detroit Lions. Sure, it might feel like we're existing in some sort of abstract, nightmarish hellscape, but our beloved Lions sitting at 0-5 tells me that we're living in true, absolute reality. I hope you're well, despite the challenging times. I've still got so much to be grateful for, I bet you you do too. So, in this week's trite, cliche platitude that still rings true despite being constantly overused, brought to you by the fine folks over at Hobby Lobby and their live, laugh, love signs... Let's focus on appreciating all that we have to be thankful for. Let's practice gratitude where it's due and maybe even where it isn't. (laughs) And on the flip side, just as importantly, make sure you're spending enough energy on those around you. Maybe you're giving it back to somebody who's been giving you a lot of good energy, or maybe you're simply paying it forward to somebody else altogether. Be fucking cool is what I'm trying to say. Be fucking cool to yourself. Be fucking cooler to others. Be fucking cool. It's that simple. This has been Cliche Corner brought to you by Hobby Lo- Oh wait. What's that now? Okay, I'm being told that Hobby Lobby has pulled their sponsorship because I said fucking a bunch of times in the Live Laugh Love Cliche Corner. Imagine that. The same folks who took their refusal to participate in Obamacare because of their religious objection to contraception took that all the way to the Supreme Court, is levying moral judgment upon my language and my ad for them? Hobby Lobby. Come for the civil rights violations? Leave once you learn they no longer accept coupons. To all you crafters out there, you heard that right. Hobby Lobby is no longer accepting coupons. This kind of sounds like when OnlyFans decided to no longer allow pornography on its website. In both cases, you people know where all of your income comes from, right? Porn. And for Hobby Lobby... Coupons! How about that? (laughs) An organic comparison between OnlyFans and Hobby Lobby. They would absolutely hate that, I bet. If somehow I could get Planned Parenthood in the mix, it would really set it off. But honestly, I'm grateful to all of you listening. I know I haven't been nearly as consistent with my schedule this year, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm so appreciative that you're sticking with me on this journey that you're either still listening after all 150 episodes, or maybe you're just giving it a shot for the first time now. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. If you're still on the fence about watching the show versus listening to it, I highly recommend taking this opportunity to watch this particular episode. It's a multimedia experience these days, and today is no exception. In fact, one of the more difficult but rewarding challenges of this project has been trying to find the right mix of audio and visual content To keep it interesting to both the listeners and the viewers, the same, right? Some jokes work purely with audio. Some jokes require a little bit of visual. Some jokes are purely visual but require some audio. It's a good mix, but I'm interested how I'm doing in that regard. Do you feel like you're being left out of anything if you're only doing it on one side, either listening or watching? I'd be grateful for any feedback that you have for the show. Uh, Look, whether you like it or not, y'all are the early adopters of what I'm building here, so that makes you part of the team. So speak up. Direct, honest feedback. It's all I'm asking for here, people. It's so very valuable. 
But if you're more of the silent partner type, well, feel free to check out patreon.com slash a talk in the attic. I repeat, patreon.com slash a talk in the attic. That's where you can contribute as little as $5 a month to support this podcast and the studio at large. If you're able, please consider signing up at patreon.com slash a talk in the attic. If you can't swing $5 a month or don't want to, I totally get it. Nothing is more important in all of this than you sticking with the show. So beyond all else, keep listening, keep watching, be fucking cool. Let's start the show. All right, people, I am absolutely stoked for this one today. It is the 150th episode, the big 150 after all, so we have to make it a special one, right? And to commemorate this, our sesquicentennial, that's right, say it with me now, sesquicentennial, I'm going to be talking with a panel of guests today who are going to help me answer some real questions from real fans of the show. There will be three of us in total today. Of course, there's going to be me, and then sitting over here on my right... It's Herbie McNulty, who is just a, just an absolute delight. I'm just honored. It's my honor. Of course, of course. And then on my left is Mr. Nasty, who, as the name might suggest, specializes in all things nasty. Coming at you live from the studio. I'm so happy to be here. I've been talked about in some of the earlier episodes, and now I'm here, baby. Thanks for having me, Kurt. What's up, Herbie? <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, we'll get to that later. Thank you for being here, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here to both of you. Uh, if this were something that Jessica and I were watching on TV, it would be the point in the episode where I would say, oh, great, what a diverse panel, three white guys. But hey, in case you haven't noticed already, I am playing all three characters in this panel. So I figured that a dig on poor diversity probably beats going blackface. I'll live with my decision. Before we get into this panel discussion where we take questions, let me explain a little bit about each of these two characters, Herbie and Mr. Nasty. I created these characters back in the fall of 2018, which was a very formative period of my life. Uh, Probably the most formative, at least in my adult life. I had just stopped boozing. My brother was dealing with a serious health issue. I just started hanging out with Jessica, reconnecting with Jessica. I was starting to see through my leadership at work. What else is there? Donald Trump was in full effect. And then on top of all this, the Me Too movement was going on. So that was becoming a very large part of the conversation. Some very terrible behavior by lots of powerful men was being unearthed. I had an IT guy come up to me at work one time during that era and said, boy, it sure is difficult being a guy these days, huh? And I just completely undressed him uh, because no, Greg, it's not that difficult of a time to be a guy. Um, Still quite advantaged. And by the way, Greg, do you have something to hide from college? Are you going to be found out to be some predator or something? If so, then yeah, it's a difficult time. If you're just a regular dude trying to do your best, it wasn't that scary of a time. But that doesn't mean we all had to modify our behavior and reconsider what was appropriate and what wasn't. A little self-reflection, a little maturation, call it what you will. So with the help of two distinct Snapchat filters... I created two characters, Herbie and Mr. Nasty, both of which were absolutely a part of me, the real me, but I simply splintered them off and disintegrated them from myself and did it in a way that allowed me to kind of be two parts of myself in a way that I no longer could at this point in life. Let me explain. Herbie is an absolute vulnerable sweetheart who trusts everybody, uh, something that you really can't be by the time you're in your mid-30s. You can't trust everyone. You've kind of learned that. But it sure feels nice. So that's kind of where Herbie came from. Mr. Nasty, on the other hand, is is the kind of guy that we all have had since we were junior high age. It never really goes away. Uh, we just kind of swallow it and stop expressing it, I guess. Uh, but it's still kind of in there. So by creating these two characters, it allowed me to kind of express some some unique viewpoints, usually in a comedic fashion. I'm not talking anything seriously here. 
in a comedic fashion, but kind of keep my my arm's length distance away from it both. I would never say any of the stuff that Mr. Nasty says now, and I wouldn't have said it for some time, maybe since I was 14 or 15, and I would never be as open and trusting as Herbie is, maybe not since I was five or six or something. Uh, so this was a way for me to express all that. It was fun. We often hear about personality integration in, in a psychology conversation. This is the opposite of that. This is kind of a personality disintegration. Of course, when I was working on these characters back in the beginning, I was just using this as a distraction because I needed some sort of creative outlet. But looking back on it now, it's kind of become clear what was really at play. And that's why I want to express this to you. Enough of this pseudo-intellectualism. Let's get to this Ask the Panel Q&A session featuring me, Featuring Herbie the Sweetheart. It's crazy that somebody wants to know about me anyway. <laughs> and Mr. Nasty, the man himself. Yes. And we're going to start with this question from Gene and Grand Rapids. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this uh, question is for Mr. Nasty. Uh, huge fan, by the way, Mr. Nasty. Wish uh, you were around a little bit more, but I get it. You got to keep your nastiness in check sometimes. Anyway. I want to know the origin of whence you've come from, Mr. Nasty. Where did you come from? And not from your mama and not from your papa. Where did you come from, Mr. Nasty? What planet? I appreciate the question, Gene. I really do. But I wasn't born from a papa and I wasn't born from a mama. I was born from a toxic masculine culture that saw Saved by the Bell, a show geared towards children, young school children. What do they do half the time on that show? They objectify the woman. What's up, Mama, said A.C. Slater. What's up, baby, said Zach. Even Screech was always scheming to get into Lisa Turtle's pants. That's where I came from. Now suddenly, just because you know, we found out that women cared about being objectified, I'm supposed to change? Ah, oh, hell no. I came from telling little girls every time you see them, oh, you look cute. You look pretty. You never tell boys they look cute and pretty. It sets up a strange dichotomy now, doesn't it? One where the ladies feel like the objects and the men feels like the auctioneers looking to buy the best prize, and that's wrong. That's what I was born from. It ain't from a planet. It ain't from a person. It's from a culture, Gene. Surprise, you even have to ask that. And I know you got some nastiness inside you. It's impossible to have not picked some of that up. Some of you grew up in the church. It's everywhere in the church. Only men can be priests, blah, 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 blah. Some of you grew up in sports. It's right been in sports. The women is bird is weak. The man is strong, blah, blah, blah. You see, it sets us up in our minds, and the internet pornography came along and changed everything. Am I getting through to you, Gene? That's where I came from, Gene. And I don't mean to get fiery, I don't mean to be so ferocious, but I just gotta have to defend myself constantly. What do you mean where I come from? What do you mean when surprised men behave bad? They've been allowed to behave bad the whole time, the whole life, everything, forever. Next question, Kirk. Here's another quick one from uh, your friend Syrup. For, uh, once again, directed at Mr. Nasty. Oh, shit, my boy, Syrup. Syrup, my What's up, Syrup? Hey, Mr. Damn. Nasty. It's your boy, Syrup. Man, I've been meaning to ask you this for quite a while. I just gotta know, what was it? What was it in your childhood that uh, just turned you into the real Mr. Nasty? Huh? Well, like I said, I just told Gene that's the same answer. That's where the real Mr. Nasty came from. That's where, in the darkness part of your soul, when you look down in there and you... You try to picture a beautiful mountain landscape to calm your mind. But when you're looking at the beautiful mountainscape and the hilltops, all you can picture when you look at two mountains is a couple of tits. A couple of big, bodacious brassicists. You know? That's where I come from. I'd like to just take in the mountains. I would. I'd love to take in the mountains, Gene. I'd love to take in the mountain syrup. But I can't. Now when all these boob-shaped land formations is cropping up all around me. Where, where were we? Next question, Kurt. This question is for Herbie the Sweetheart. Who do you like to hang out better with? A Mr. Nasty or Kirk? And why? Oh boy, oh boy, I, don't, I wouldn't want to hurt anyone's feelings here. 
you know, uh, just meeting Mr. Nasty for the first time. He's funny, I guess, but he's kind of really not exactly my style because he's just so, uh, <laughs> sexual. He's so sexual. We're <laughs> kind of more of an emotional kind of guy. Uh, so I, I think I would, I'd rather hang out with Kurt just because I, I see a little bit more of myself in him. And at the end of the day, you know, we all just want a friend who's a little bit like us and, right? And again, no offense, Mr. Nasty. <laughs> you are nasty, boy! I love how you say that. You go, nasty! You get real nasty! <laughs> I just don't have it in me. Did I answer the damn question? More like, oh, he's sweet. Ah, oh, cute, cute, see ya. So yeah. Herbie. I want to know what tugs at your heartstrings. Oh boy, what tugs at my heartstrings? <sighs> kind of a tough question because at the end of the day, it's really just if you're being yourself and you're being authentic to who you are. That's really just man. I'll be we'll be watching. I'll be watching something with my babe, like even like American Idol or something cheesy like that, and the person will talk about following their dreams, and I'll be a blabbering mess. <laughs> Turn on the waterworks for herbs. Oh, Herb's about to cry! <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, anything talks about heartstrings, sentimentality, and things like comer certain car commercials will make uh, will make Herbie cry even. And oh man, I just love it when people are themselves. I have I, I was hidden away for a long time, and I couldn't really express myself. And now here I am, and I, and I just stayed the course. And at the end of the day, look at me now. You know. <laughs> Here I am, I'm on a podcast! That's what, I mean, that's what, if I, if I were to be watching a story of my life, as Herbie McNulty's life, and I were watching, I'd be bawling right now, so this would be pulling at my heart, my heartstrings. Uh, uh, Mr. Nasty, I don't know what would pull at his heartstrings, he probably is more interested in what would, more interested in what would tug at his penis, tug really? at his penis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's putting weird thoughts in my mouth. <laughs> you are nasty, boy. I love how you say that. Nasty. <laughs> Not me. No, I'm just sweet. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay, Mr. Nasty. Do you think you'd win in the Squid Games? And if you think you'd win, why do you think you'd win? Thank you, Dan from Seattle. Wow, Dan, I can't give away too much because not all of our viewers and listeners have seen the Squid Games. Squid. Ooh, one of my least favorite seafoods. And what the hell is calamari anyway? Are they wings? What is that? What is it? They got wings around it. What's in the middle? Shit. Squid game. I think I would probably not do so great in that game. I would have been distracted by all the vulnerable other souls in there looking to, to rely on their more base, the more, the more base desires, having sex. In the bathroom and having sex in the dorm room. I've probably been distracted, Dan, if I'm being honest. But one round I know I do well in is that honeycomb round, baby. I've been doing the ABCs with this tongue for 25 years. Wow. Talk about cunnilingus. All right, I got a question for Mr. Nasty. Um, have you ever shoved a whole bag of Skittles up someone's ass and then had them push them out into your mouth like a... Little rainbow flavored rainbow turds. I don't know who. Uh, now I now I understand why that caller didn't leave his name. <laughs> who asked that? What do you tell yourself? You call that in anonymously? Making Mister Nasty look less nasty. That's gross. No one ever put Skittles in nobody's ass and then ate it out afterwards. Now I have done that with various syrups. I personally like orange marmalade. Gucci, Gucci, la la, yeah, talking about Lady Mama la. <laughs> you disgusting, boy. Next question. Hi, Mr. Nasty. I was just curious what your favorite thing to eat is. My favorite thing to eat? Wow, that's a quite a personal question there. I'm going to put it simple. A nice, clean ass. I like a nice, clean ass. Kirk, you don't like a nice... I know you like a nice, clean ass. Even Herbie over here likes a nice, clean ass. You ask me on my favorite thing to eat, it's a clean ass. Clean ass to eat. It's what's for dinner, baby. 
I don't know where you thought I was going to take that one, man, there from Grand Haven, but what you expect, huh? Shit! Lit up on a silver platter, like a silver platter full of ass! Hey, Herbie. Yeah, I was wondering if you like pillow talk. I'm just asking for a friend. Who doesn't like a good round of pillow talk? I'm sorry to cut off the question, but I mean, pill pillow talk is when you're at your most vulnerable. You've had the whole day to process everything that's going on. And everything that made you feel certain ways throughout the day, but now you're... You're there with the person that you trust most, the person that you let even see you with your shirt off! <laughs> so obviously you're willing to bear it all with this person, and of course you want to talk about what's on your mind, and, and what's makes you nervous, but also what makes that person you're with so special and you want to let them know that maybe you've lost, uh, maybe you lost perspective and lost sight of that throughout the day and didn't really show that person how you felt, but now is your last chance before you put your head down to sleep for the night and hopefully dream of sugar plums and <laughs> all sorts of delicious treats and then before you go to sleep you always tell your lover that you love them. You let them, you let your lover know, or whoever you're doing the pillow talk with. It doesn't have to be your lover. Mr. Nasty's got me thinking I'm nasty. Like, it's a lover. It could be pillow talk with your kid, or pillow talk with your friend on a business trip before you're going to bed or something. Uh, just let that person know how you feel about them. You never know when you're going to get another chance to do it. And that's what pillow talk is for me. So, of course I like pillow talk. Who wouldn't, huh? <laughs> this bitch don't know about Pangea. <laughs> that's my favorite little Dickie song. Brain. On some other shit, though. Pillow Talk? Yeah, I like the song Pillow Talk better than I like actual Pillow Talk. Uh, this bitch don't know about Pangea. <laughs> Next question. Herbie, what is the most romantic date you have ever been on? And what did it consist of? You're such a little heart throb and just such a cute little guy i just needed to know i was wondering this myself actually about you great question this is yeah. a great question because <laughs> i look oh i had the best date in mind so so I, I was with my babe and we had just kind of reconnected and we were walking around uh grand rapids the city that she didn't really know that well and i was still shy and excited to show it up like i had something to do with it <laughs> I just lived there. I didn't have anything to do with the planning of the city or anything, but I was walking around and showing her the city and talking about this building and that building and, well, this building does this, that building does that. <laughs> I just I tried to impress her with my knowledge of the building, I guess, but every once in a while we would stop at a corner and we would just smooch at the corner. I remember it was a super warm day and it just felt like we were just being bathed in bath water. It was so warm and quiet and peaceful and nice every time I kissed her. But I guess my idea of the most romantic date is just walking around with my babe, just smooching on the corners. Smooch, stealing a smooch, telling jokes and stealing smooches. <laughs> Not to get nasty, like, but like, yeah. keep it classy, keep it. Not so nasty, keep it classy. <laughs> I just pulled it because I'm so excited to be on the show. I'm sorry, Kirk. Sorry. What's your idea of a good that? Nah, nah, it's your show. I shouldn't be speaking and asking questions when I haven't been interviewing you. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Oh my lord! It's been fun fielding these questions with, uh, but I guess there some of them came in for me as well. Hey, good morning, there, Kurt. Wanted to give you a quick call on the show this morning and see if you could help me end a little dispute that I'm having. You see, last night, my partner and I were talking about staying clean. And it's an important thing, but not everyone always wants to talk about it. Especially Gary over here. <laughs> Easy, Gary. Now, what we were saying is when you get in the shower, where's the first place you start scrubbing and I mean I don't want to know where you get wet first but where do you actually start working on that grime and dirt now I was saying with those long flowing locks you got up on your head you probably start at the tippy top but Gary seems to think you start somewhere down in your nether regions maybe work your way out from the plums so if you could give us a little answer to that it would really help me and Boy, oh boy, I think if I'm right, I got a real wild weekend coming my way. All right, buddy. Take care now. <laughs> wow. Well, Gary and Milt, uh, first off, you sound an awful lot like Carl from Royal Oak, but I will let it slide because it's a good question. I spent an awful lot of time, an awful lot of energy, 
and to figuring out the order in which I scrub when I shower, to be totally honest. And it has changed with my hair getting longer. So now here's my here's my routine. It's tried and true. And I start with a solid shampoo right away. Shampoo the shit out of my hair. That's the source of a lot of potential contaminants. So I get the tackle that right away. Next, I put in conditioner. Uh, of course, we all know conditioner takes a little bit of time to take effect. So I put that in next and keep it off of my skin. Then I soap the entire body. Look, I always want to remember to do my face first. In fact, considering the fact I'm just using this the bar of soap, but I ultimately, oftentimes, and I'm not too proud to admit that I'll, I'll start with my ass, and it'll be, yeah, I'm figuring Mr. Nasty would like that, but it's true. And then I try to remember to clean it off before I do it all, but you know who knows? I figure once you're in the shower, once you're touching the soap and all of that, as long as you Did that answer the damn question. Okay, sorry, I do I do tend to get long winded. Yes, so shampoo. Conditioner, soap, rinse, rinse, out. It's a pretty quick process. Hey there, this is Pat, longtime listener, first time caller. Kirk, if you could pick anyone to play you in a movie about your life, who would you pick? Hmm. That's a that's a provocative question. I, I guess at this point, it's it's ill defined. Like, what is my what is my story at the end of this whole thing? Is it an action flick? I, it doesn't seem like that. It's going to be what it is. Unless I'm like Liam Neeson and something changes very late in my life. Uh, is it a comedy? Could be. Oh, boy. I really like Jason Siegel from Forgetting Sarah Marshall and I Love You, Man. He, you know, he's in so many flicks. He played David Foster Wallace in that end of the tour flick. Um, he's in The Muppets. I kind of like that guy. I feel like I have a similar disposition as him, possibly. Uh, so I, I guess I'm going to go with Jason Siegel. And he's he's versatile. That's the other thing. He's versatile. I, if I stick with a guy like that, however my life ends up when it's all said and done, uh, it will have been covered by his acting his acting skills because he's not just a one-trick pony. So Jason Siegel. What do you think? What about if you're listening, what, who should, who would play me? So I put on a robe recently thinking I would look kind of like uh, sexy or something. And I looked in the mirror and I look more like current day Steven Seagal. Uh, so I guess Steven Seagal, if I end up going more directly into the Asian culture, which I'm a fan of. But if I start decorating like Steven Seagal and start wearing kimonos and learning martial arts, maybe Steven Seagal. Um, part of me would like to say Tracy Morgan because he's hilarious. And I think that would... That would, you know, more white roles should start going to some black folks. Um, I'd be honored if Tracy played me. I, I could just picture myself walking into the podcast saying, Somebody here is getting pregnant! Herb, what's your favorite kind of breakfast? My favorite kind of breakfast? How'd you know I was a breakfast guy? I'm the kind of guy that likes to get up. Uh, I don't like to get up early a lot of times. But if there's breakfast to be had, or better yet, if there's breakfast to be made, I love getting up and making a nice crab cake Benedict, uh, and just making the hollandaise right on time so that it doesn't get all coagulated. I don't know if you've ever had a bad hollandaise, but it's gross. So just making sure I keep the hollandaise nice and silky. And so crab, crab cake Benedict. And anytime I can be around, I, like I picture me and you, whoever asked that question in that deep voice, and me and Mr. Nasty and Kirk all sitting down sometime with my babe and just having Crab's Cake Benedict, talking about the good times, talking about things to come. Uh, I sound like I'm reciting a Cat Stevens, not a Cat Stevens song here, but I do love me some Cat Stevens. He was in this long. <laughs> just having breakfast and talking, talking with friends about what, how you feel and about all the good things you have to be grateful for. It's like Kirk said earlier. Kirk, do you, do you mind if I <laughs> take over the end of the show here? It's like Kirk said earlier. It's just about having breakfast with your friends and at the end of the day being grateful for what you have. Being grateful that you have an opportunity to eat at all, let alone with somebody. And if it's a solo breakfast that you're having, there's still an awful lot of value in that because you got yourself, you got your health. Whatever you've got, hang on to it. Be grateful for it. And make sure you let everyone know who ought to know 
that you love them. Kirk. If you could invite anybody into the attic, dead or alive. If you could have five minutes in an elevator with anyone, who would you want it to be? And why? Boy, I, I think I would probably go Robin Williams. I think that dude is such a comedic genius. It would be fun. It would fly by. He'd probably have some pot. Uh, Robin Williams. I think he seems like the ideal elevator. I mean, he's a little bit high anxiety, right? And being stuck in an elevator for five seconds, let alone five minutes, would have my anxiety going crazy. Uh, but I'm going to stick with Robin Williams. And if, if, if there were any secondary choices, it would be someone in that vein, someone that makes me laugh. Mitch Hedberg, oh lord, I, th I feel like he'd be freaking out just because he's he wouldn't do great in that stressful situation. But if he could stay calm, can I change my answer? Can it be Mitch Hedberg and Robin Williams and me? Another diverse panel, but uh, yeah. And I would let's take Robin Williams from the air when he had long hair, just so the three of us can all have long hair. We'll definitely be partying in that elevator as well. So that's a good question. I like that one. Jessica, you know it would be you, but you know for fun I had to answer this in a different kind of way. So I love you, Mr. Nasty. If you had to make up a sixth love language, what would okay. it be and why? Finally, a question that's really going to challenge my intellectualism when it comes to the ladies and the relationships. Now, ladies, not the ladies. Don't get it twisted. That could mean you boys. That's right, Mr. Nasty is sexually fluid. Don't want anybody feeling left out. Six love language. How <clears throat> honestly, physical touch already exists. Quality time already exists. Acts of service already exists. Right? You combine all three of those, you got the Mr. Nasty experience. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you gotta submit yourself over to physical dominance by a loved one and distrust. Trust that they're not going to take it too far, but what if they do? Maybe you might like it. Maybe they go too far, then the next time it's not far enough. And before you know it, and before you know it, there's nothing on this green, and before you know it, there's nothing on God's green earth that even satisfy you anymore. You've done it all. It's too much. You've reached new levels of nastiness. That's what I, my fear is. If I add another love language, it might be too much. I've got the system down, quality time, that's a service, physical touch, baby. Combine those three, my three favorite love languages. Woo! No need for another one at that point now, is there? Yeah, but not enough love languages. There's too many already. I'd say pair it down from five to three. Mainly because I don't remember the other two. Next question, Terry. Hey, Mr. Nasty. This is Hector from St. Louis. Sorry about the reception, but I'm in my mom's basement. Uh, long time listener here, first time caller. Uh, got a two parter for you. Is it acceptable to introduce role playing into a relationship? And if so, when is the appropriate amount of time to introduce that? Thanks. I'll hang up and listen. First off, thank you for the call, Hector. What do you call it, from 1999? Was that a Razor flip phone? You can't... The reception sounded a little different. <laughs> Hector. It is appropriate. It's at any time, anytime you're with a lover that you love and that loves you back and you're in it together, there should be nothing that's off limits. You can bring anything up at any time. You could be waiting for your parent teacher conferences for your eldest, most problematic child when you squeeze the, the knee or the thigh of your mate and give it that little eye that says, hey, baby, let's meet in the custodial closet in five minutes. I'll be in the restroom freshening it up. <laughs> the role playing there would be your uh, both custodians, of course, engaging in completely age appropriate, completely consensual sex, but you're getting the mops involved like a French tickler dangling down on your neck, tickling the toes with some chemical sprayers, using that weird sawdust material that the, the janitors used to use to suck up the. Vomit when children would puke in gym class. Use that as some sort of fairy dust and <sighs> blow it in each other's faces and then blow it in each other's faces, if you know what I mean. Of course, there's never a bad time to bring in role playing. You should start right now. Go. Next question. Kirk, what's your favorite kind of cheese? What is my favorite kind of cheese? I mean, 
I'm not a huge cheese guy. I'm going to be totally honest with you. The older I've gotten, the less uh, – you don't want to hear about my lactose intolerance. I can think of no worse conversation piece. But I'll tell you which, which cheese I hate. Um, American cheese. Uh, it's the only cheese, to my knowledge, that comes pressed into plastic. And I, I always wonder about that. Like, if you're the rest of the world, do you even know what American cheese is? And if you do, you must consider – it kind of par for the course for, for the U.S., right? Heavily processed, poor version of existing cheese of existing products, and then with extra waste on top of that. And I'm not, I'm not anti-American, but we go through a lot of waste here. We've, we're wasting a lot. And I think the American cheese slice, individually wrapped slice, is probably no better indicator than that. So what's my favorite cheese? I don't really have one. What's my least favorite cheese? American cheese. You heard it here first. Suck it. Patriots. Okay, I don't need anyone calling in the show and calling me a calling me a, a non patriot or something, or that I hate the troops. I don't hate the troops. Okay. So okay, and then here's another one. Kirk, does it irk you to be sandwiched between two K's? Does it irk me? This is this is a word joke. See, sometimes callers call in and they're trying to be the funny people. Does it irk me to be stuck between two K's? I mean, no. I like that. It's better than this being stuck between a J and a K, when I, which I've been called just as often jerk. Okay. Uh, sometimes people call me Kurt. It irks me more when I'm between a K and a T than between two Ks. As long as I'm not between three Ks. And I, that could either be a baseball reference or a Ku Klux Klan reference. I don't want to be struck out, just like I don't want any involvement with the KKK. I'm down with the KKK. I don't hate the troops, and I hate the KKK. I couldn't be any more clear on those two facts okay great sorry i just said k there mr nasty do you have any purple underwear what do you think <laughs> my question is for kurt how would you approach your best friend or would you even approach your best friend if their mate was trying to get with you sexually oh my goodness oh that's an that's a serious one i need to answer that with a serious uh, nature here so I'll, re I'll repeat this so it's clear would i tell my best friend if my best friend's boyfriend or girlfriend was trying to get with me sexually a hundred percent of course i would do that uh as quickly as you possibly can uh if if there's any concern about your friend taking it the wrong way or taking it as if um it's a jealousy move or something like that then I, that's on them, I guess. You know, you can preface it with whatever you want. Uh, is, do you have a history of, of sleeping with this particular best friend's mates? If there's no history there, then it should be an easy conversation. If you've screwed up in the past or something and you've already done this, then there's going to be some concern about you being a single white female type vibe where you're trying to steal that person's life. So if that's you, I would question, you know, your motives on that. I know you who called this. I know who left the message. So I know that's not the case. Therefore, have the conversation as soon as possible. It's kind of fucked up. Good luck with that one. Seriously, good luck with that one. Don't let it get you down, though. Stay positive about it all. Like you said on the cliche corner, might as well just finish the show up here for you. Like you said earlier on the Live, Laugh, Love cliche corner, it's just about being grateful for what you've got, being grateful to those of you that have helped you out along the way and continue to give you some of their energy. It's about just being kind, and being, pardon my French, fucking cool. <laughs> Be cool. Okay, let's just wrap it up with that. On behalf of Mr. Nasty and your host, Kirk Ross, can't believe I'm doing this, this is Irby McNulty signing off. Peace out, everybody. I love what you're done with the show, Kirk. I really am. Could be a little more sexually explicit, in my opinion. <laughs> But well, that's your show, baby. It's your show. <laughs> that was fun. I want to thank Herbie. I want to thank Mr. Nasty. Uh, I, I, I don't even know how to wrap it up yet because I still haven't recorded the responses of Mr. Nasty or Herbie. So I'm trying to pretend like I know. Wow. What's, we had some ups and downs. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I probably did. Jury's still out, of course. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>